When atoms or molecules absorb energy, the energy is often released as light energy. And we observe this in fireworks, in neon lights, in the fluorescent lights. Um, molecules or atoms absorbing energy and then releasing that as light. When we take that emitted light and pass it through a prism, we do not see a continuous rainbow. We see a pattern of lines, bright lines of color with darkness in between. And the pattern is unique to each atom or molecule, each type, and it's called an emission spectrum. It's not continuous. It can be used to identify the element. You can look at the emission of an element and identify what it is. It's almost like a fingerprint. And this idea, this observation, cannot be explained by classical physics. Newtonian physics, you throw a ball and it goes the same way every time. Quantum mechanics is what explains this. Here are examples of um, mercury, helium, and hydrogen lamps. And this is the same idea as a neon light. You have the gas, there's mercury gas, helium gas, hydrogen gas, and you pass electrical current through it. You're putting energy into the individual atoms, and it causes the gas to glow. And the color that you see is a combination of the different wavelengths of light that are emitted by those elements. We can also see this in what's known as a flame test. You put sodium into a flame, you provide it with energy, you get this very distinctive bright yellow glow. Potassium gives a lavender flame, lithium gives a red flame, barium gives kind of a greenish flame. Barium's hard to tell, hard to see. The colors there that we see are a result of this emission spectrum. So here's the hydrogen lamp. It's giving off light. I think it was kind of a pinkish light. If we pass that through a slit to focus, uh, not to focus, but to just to select a narrow band, and then we pass that through a prism, if this was light from the sun, we would expect to see a rainbow over here. But we don't. We see four lines, only four lines. The wavelengths of light that are emitted by the excited hydrogen atoms have specific energies. Here's um, the helium spectrum, barium. This is white light, like you would see from the sun. There's oxygen and neon. A little hard to see in the well-lit classroom, but you can look at them there in your, in your textbook. There's, you can do emission spectroscopy or absorption. Um, so this would be a measuring the emission. We see these bright bands. The way the instrument is set up, you don't always get perfect darkness in between, but we definitely see these bright lines. If we're measuring the absorption of light, then we see the reverse. We see dark lines at specific wavelengths of light because the mercury is absorbing that frequency and letting the other frequencies go past. Yes? So the bands are at the same places? The bands are at the same places. Yeah. Uh, Johannes Rydberg looked at these atomic spectra and tried to figure out what's the relationship between these lines. Because they're always the same for a given element. There's got to be some relationship. And so he found that he could describe them with an equation that involved an inverse square of integers. Um, and this was what he came up with, that 1 over the lambda equals r, a constant, times 1 over m squared minus 1 over n squared, where n and m are integers. And it describes the patterns that we see. But it doesn't explain anything. This is a law. It's an observation. It doesn't explain anything. We don't understand why atomic spectra are discrete, giving specific lines. We don't understand, doesn't tell us why atoms are stable. And we don't understand why his equation works just by looking at the equation. So nice try, Rydberg. 
Rutherford. Rutherford's nuclear model of the atom. I believe we talked about Rutherford earlier. Um, his model says that the atom has a tiny dense center called the nucleus. The nucleus contains essentially all of the mass of the atom. It's positively charged. The amount of positive charge balances the negative charge of the electrons, and the electrons are moving around in the empty space that is the rest of the atom. So that's review. Um, what are problems with Rutherford's model? Well, electrons in his model are moving charged particles. Moving charged particles, according to classical physics, give off energy. So if we have these particles giving off energy, how can they keep moving? And we should be able to detect that energy. The atoms should be glowing if these moving charged particles are giving off energy. The electrons should be losing energy because they, there's no energy source, and so they should eventually crash and burn, like, like something orbiting the Earth at an unstable orbit. Right? It doesn't happen, though. So the nuclear model doesn't explain what's happening in the structure of the atom when atoms gain or lose, elect lose energy. So Niels Bohr came along, and he developed a model that explained that, how the structure of the atom changes when it undergoes energy transitions. And Bohr's model is, is really great in some aspects, but we'll find out very soon that it's not right. We still learn from it. His major idea was that the energy of the atom is quantized, meaning there are specific levels. The atom can only have very specific amounts of energy. And the amount of energy in the atom is related to the electron's position in the atom. So where the atom is in the, I'm sorry, where the electron is in the atom is going to affect the energy of the atom. So his idea was that the electrons travel in orbits around the nucleus. So this resembles the solar system. So students tend to like the Bohr model because we can kind of picture this. So the nucleus is like the sun, and the electrons are like planets that are orbiting around. The energy of each orbit is fixed or quantized. And so what happens when an atom absorbs energy is the electrons are going to jump to a different level. If they get energy in, they can jump to a higher energy orbit. And if they jump from a higher energy orbit to a lower one, then they emit that energy as radiation. And we see that as a photon of light being emitted. The distance between the orbits is going to determine the energy of the photon of light that's produced. Now where this gets a little into quantum mechanics is that the electron is never observed between states. It's only in one state or another, and this is called a quantum leap, where it, it can be in level one or in level two, and it can go from one to two or two to one, but it can never um, be observed between. The energy of the photon that's emitted is um, equal to the energy difference between those two orbits or states. And so by observing the light that's emitted and the energy of the light, we can actually calculate the energy of those different orbits. It's pretty cool. So the Bohr model has great historical conceptual importance, but ultimately it was replaced. Here's the Bohr, picture of the Bohr model. Here's the nucleus. Um, there's orbit or energy level one, two, three, four, five. As the energy increases, the distance from the nucleus gets larger. If you put energy into a hydrogen atom, you can cause an electron to move from level one up to level five, perhaps. It will not stay up there indefinitely. It will come down. As it comes down, if it makes the transition from five to two, it's going to give off a photon of light. And the energy of that light is related to its wavelength. 
and we see the wavelength as a violet color. And so we can measure the energy difference between level 5 and level 2. Transitions from 4 to 2 give off this blue-green light. Transitions from 3 to 2 give off red light. So you can measure the wavelengths of the light, and you can calculate the difference in the energy levels. This is really awesome. Problem is, it only works for hydrogen. Bummer. <laughs>